medieval weapons used in World War I. Chainmail, catapults, and spiked clubs, all common weapons used hundreds of years ago in countless battles and engagements, had long been forgotten when Europe erupted into conflict in 1914. The early 20th century saw many new inventions that were intended to improve people's living conditions, such as vacuum cleaners, air conditioning, and electric washing machines. But there were also many new developments in the methods that people could use to kill one another. Chemicals such as chlorine gas and mustard gas, coupled with widespread use of new weapons such as the machine gun, made combat a living nightmare for soldiers on both sides of the conflict. Perhaps even more harrowing than the progression towards these new weapons was the regression back towards the basic weapons from the past. In stark contrast to the advancing technology of the 20th century, many soldiers who were stuck in the close corridors of trench warfare found themselves back in the medieval era. Hand-to-hand -hand combat became commonplace in the suffocating atmosphere of the trenches. Blunt weapons, swords, and knives replaced bayonets, which were too long to properly maneuver in confined spaces. Everywhere, soldiers spent their free time fashioning these crude instruments to address the obstacles of fighting in a trench. Here are five ways the Great War brought back the medieval period. The Leech Trench Catapult Invented by Claude Pemberton Leech in response to the German Werthmaschine, which was a spring-powered instrument that could launch a hand grenade 220 yards, the trench catapult was used by British divisions in 1915. Officially, it was known as the Leech Trench Catapult after its inventor. This device was produced in central London by the Gamages department store. The design was cheap and easy to make as it consisted of a Y-shaped frame and rubber bands pulled tight with a windlass. The catapult could be activated by releasing the hook catch and firing a projectile between 120 and 150 yards across no man's land into the enemy trenches. In all, 150 catapults were made and each division received 20 of them. Although the weapon would be quickly replaced by the French Sauterelle A catapult at the end of 1915, and then by the Stokes Mortar and the Rifle Grenade Launcher in March 1916, the Leech Trench catapult was effective at lobbing projectiles, mainly grenades, into the enemy trenches. One element of trench warfare that plagued soldiers was the inability to safely stand up in the trench. Snipers in the opposing trench lines eagerly waited for the signs of life to aim at. But with the introduction of trench catapults, soldiers no longer had to stand up to throw grenades at the enemy. Instead, men could take cover inside the trench and aim the catapult to fire at the enemy without exposing themselves to enemy sniper fire. The Morning Star Trench Club Unlike other World War I weapons that were mass-produced in factories, trench clubs and other blunt objects were the products of a soldier's creativity. To occupy their time, many of them began making crude weapons such as the spiked club, known as a morning star, to protect themselves in the event that hand-to-hand -hand combat broke out. The object of these weapons was to incapacitate or kill enemy soldiers quickly and silently. Many times, trench raids carried out at night relied on the stealthy nature of these blunt weapons to give the attacking force an element of surprise. The Morning Star was made of a wooden handle with a spiked ball fitted at the striking end. This weapon was first seen on the battlefield at the beginning of the 14th century and is most often associated with German knights, who called it Morgenstern. Throughout the centuries, the weapon retained its sinister reputation as an effective, evil-looking killing instrument. Other variants of the weapon include a chain or piece of leather attaching the spiked ball to the handle. This allowed the striking end to be swung at the opponent and is classified as a flail. Medieval flails and morning stars in World War I are terrifying reminders of the desperation that characterized the Great War. The Splatter Mask With the reintroduction of these primitive weapons on World War I battlefields, each side sought ways to protect their soldiers from shrapnel and other debris. One innovative new piece of armor that was introduced at this time was the splatter mask. These masks were designed to be worn by tank crews and protected the faces of the men from spall and red-hot splinters ricocheting around. These occur when a tank is hit by a projectile, and the shock waves on the inside send these pieces of shrapnel flying through the air, ripping through flesh and can blind crew members. In addition to this, tanks of the era were painted with lead paint, which also broke off in the shockwave and could harm the crew. 
Splatter masks minimize the effects of spalling by using the ancient technique of chainmail to cover the nose and mouth of its user. The chainmail would protect the wearer's face from small debris and lead paint in the air. Below the chainmail, a full-face leather mask helped cover the eyes and forehead, with metal eye covers allowing the soldier to see out of the mask. These masks and chainmail face guards were used in conjunction with helmets, usually attached to it with a strap, ensuring that the whole head and face was covered. Although the aesthetic look of the mask is rather eerie, its function as a face covering saved many soldiers from disfigurement. American Body Armor The Brewster Body Shield, designed by Dr. Guy Otis Brewster, was heavy body armor made out of metal and capable of stopping 303 British bullets. To prove its capabilities, he gave a demonstration to the U.S. Army. Soldiers were ordered to fire live rounds of ammunition at the body armor while Dr. Brewster himself was wearing it, and it was found that not a single bullet had penetrated the armor. Furthermore, Brewster claimed that the impact of the bullets was nothing compared to what he had prepared himself for, and the impact he experienced was just a fraction of what he was actually expecting. While this demonstration was impressive, the Army quickly realized that the Brewster body shield, consisting of just a chest and headpiece, weighed over 40 pounds, and this meant that soldiers wearing it would be very restricted moving around and running on the battlefield. Also, the headpiece section was not able to turn on its own, leaving the soldier with almost no peripheral vision. Another idea was then presented for trials, called the Sentinel, which resembled the armor worn by soldiers in the 15th century. Apart from the helmet, there was a heavy breastplate, two waist plates, and a further two plates that covered the thighs. This was complemented by sponge rubber padding underneath. They soon realized that this caused too much of a strain on the soldier's back and shoulders, but it was thought that if they added a back plate and removed the two thigh plates, it would be ideal for machine gunners, especially to protect their torsos. Fortunately for them, it never got beyond the trial stage, and the idea was shelved. Nevertheless, these inventions indicate that many countries were beginning to better understand the importance of metal helmets and effective body armor. Most casualties during the Great War were attributed to shrapnel hitting men in the chest and head, so addressing that problem would save many lives in the future. The Mark I Trench Knife The Mark I Trench Knife is an American-made weapon designed by officers of the American Expeditionary Force. It's characterized by its 17.1 centimeter or 6 and 3 quarter inch double edge that makes it both effective in slashing and thrusting attacks. The handle is made out of cast bronze, although it was chemically blackened and resembles a knuckle duster in the way each finger has an individual hole to fit through. A spike on the bow of each knuckle made it difficult for enemy soldiers to grab onto the knife in hand-to-hand -hand combat. It's the result of numerous field tests and extensive research into different designs of trench knives. In 1918, a panel of AEF officers looked at the standard-issue knives across European countries and measured how effective they were in the following criteria. Security of grip, ease of carrying when crawling, and quickness of deployment and action. The Mark I trench knife is therefore presented as having the best qualities of each trench knife that was available at the time. In particular, the double-edged blade was taken directly from the French trench knife, Couteau Poignard MLE 1916. Interestingly, the knife was not widely used in World War I as its production started at the end of the war. The trench knife saw increased use in World War II among troops that had a need for close combat weapons. It received mixed reviews from soldiers returning from World War II, but its ability to combine all the best features from other knives ensures its place in history. New innovations in the 20th century may have pushed warfare towards deadlier and more destructive battles, but it simultaneously brought the desperation of close combat back into consideration. Everywhere, soldiers had to adapt to the new style of trench warfare and use what was at hand to create weapons that were effective at close range. It took some years for the industrial production to catch up to the needs of the front line, which had opened the door for a return to the medieval era, a return to catapults, chainmail, and clubs. Handheld Shields World War I In the early days of the war, military leaders realized that a substantial amount of casualties were inflicted by shell splinters and other projectile fragments. 
Therefore, special attention was given to the protection of soldiers by introducing modern types of helmets, body armor, and protective shields. Although appearing anachronistic to the modern style of warfare, portable infantry shields found their way onto the battlefields of the First World War. These shields were modern versions of the shields found in the Middle Ages and were carried in the same manner by soldiers. Even though these handheld shields showed some advantages, their use was limited due to their physical features. In order to be effective against a standard rifle round, at a distance of 164 yards or 150 meters, the shield had to be made of at least a quarter inch or 0.6 centimeter thick alloy steel. At closer distances, the vulnerability of the shield increased. Since it was carried by hand, the shield was intended to cover at least the body and head of a soldier. Taking this into account, the average surface area had to be around 25 inches or 64 centimeters high and 15 inches or 38 centimeters wide. With such dimensions, the weight of the shield was a big problem, especially when carried by one hand. In the first year of the war, combatants decided to introduce infantry shields as an experiment, as they did with other protective gear. German soldiers were provided with small portable shields that proved useless during their swift march through Belgium so the concept was quickly abandoned. The French were particularly interested in the idea of portable infantry shields. One of their inventors, M. Daigre, designed a shield 23 inches high and 14 inches wide. The shield was made of a 0.275 inch thick steel plate covered on both sides with half an inch of woodite, a faux wood rubber material that prevented the splashing of lead and shell splinters. A canvas material was lastly put around the shield to cover it. The total weight of the shield was 21 pounds, or 9.5 kilograms. The shield was made in the shape of a round-cornered rectangle that was indented at the top right-hand corner to form a rest for a rifle. On the back of the shield were arm straps, as well as loops to support it from the neck and belt when carried as a breastplate. Even though the French produced 65,000 shields, their combat experience with it revealed obvious problems. The first problem was that it was too heavy to be carried with one hand for a long period of time during battle. It proved to be effective only when performing quick assaults on nearby trenches. The second drawback was that the soldier only had one hand free for combat with their rifle while on the move. In a quick assault, a better combination was to carry shields in one hand and a grenade, trench club, or pistol in the other. The third drawback was that even though shields were made from a strong metal, they couldn't provide adequate protection for the soldier. When carried, soldiers were protected only from the front, but they would be exposed to enemy fire from various directions. These factors and the end of the war meant that handheld portable shields were largely abandoned. EOD Suit Bomb Disposal Being an explosive ordnance disposal technician is one of the most dangerous jobs in the military. For EOD technicians, there is no way to evade the danger. Their job is to locate, identify, and neutralize an explosive device, whether it's an ordnance or an improvised one. It's a high-stake job where the slightest mistake could cost them their life. The beginnings of the EOD units go back to World War II. During the Blitz on London, many of the German bombs dropped on the city didn't explode. Some were even fused to detonate hours after they were dropped, designed to create the impression of a longer bombardment. In order to eliminate the threat of such bombs, special unexploded ordnance teams were established. These engineers by profession were tasked with finding unexploded bombs and then disarming them or detonating them safely. Soon the British were joined by volunteers from the US Navy who then passed the trade to their own units. This was the birth of the so-called bomb squad units that today exist in almost every army in the world. Since the Blitz, the Explosive Ordnance Disposal Unit's job has changed a lot. Over time, as the danger has spread from the battlefield to the streets of big cities, EOD units entered police forces as well. In recent history, there have been many challenges for EOD technicians. The problems they faced come from many different types of explosive devices, from the old unexploded bombs to sophisticated biochemical bombs. The field where they operate can be in a subway of a world metropolis to the deserts of the Middle East. The rise of the 21st century gained momentum in the development of EOD units. The war on terror pushed bomb technicians for the first time into the first lines of combat, participating in combat and covert missions. In Afghanistan and Iraq, these improvised explosive devices, or IEDs, were the equivalent of what booby traps were to US troops in the Vietnam War. 
Apart from engaging enemies directly, soldiers of the US-led coalition forces were also fighting against these invisible enemies. Far worse than landmines that soldiers were accustomed to, IEDs were impossible for ordinary infantrymen to deal with because it's an explosive that can be detonated by someone far away at the moment of their choice. The majority of these devices were made with such great skill and craftiness that only a specialist could handle them. This was the brave job for the EOD technicians. The first step for the EOD technician was to locate the device. In Afghanistan and Iraq, U.S. Army and Navy EOD units would often use bomb-sniffing dogs for that purpose. However, finding the explosive device was the easiest part. Once an IED was found and the perimeter secured, the EOD technician would commence its neutralization. The job of neutralizing the bomb has been recently switching to specialized robots controlled by EOD technicians from a safe distance. However, most missions are still performed by human technicians because of the better control in their own hands than a robot's remote controls. Apart from that, areas may often be completely unreachable to robots. Diffusing any kind of explosive device is a tricky business, but one that has to be done. At first glance, it would be much easier to detonate the bomb from a safe distance than to risk lives by neutralizing it. The reason why diffusions were performed was that there's no certainty how powerful the explosive device is, how it will react, and if there was some kind of chemical agent inside. Diffusing any kind of explosive device was a tricky business. Before making their move, the technician had to examine the device and determine how it worked. Very often, they had no luxury of taking their time. More importantly, the slightest mistake was paid at a hefty price. Unlike soldiers in combat, the EOD technician was standing inches away from the danger and had no cover to hide behind. The only thing that stood between him and the deadly contraption was his protection, the EOD suit. The EOD suit is a special protective suit designed for use by EOD specialists. Its purpose is to protect the wearer from injuries caused by an explosion. Most of this heavy and bulky suit's features are installed to protect from fragmentation caused by an eventual blast. However, modern suits are designed in such a manner that they provide protection from other injuries that could also be caused by explosive devices. The most common are blast injuries caused by an exploding blast wave, an intense overpressurization impulse created by a detonation. When it impacts the human body, this high pressure causes severe injuries on internal organs, which are usually lethal. Another type of injury could be caused by blast wind, a forced overheated airflow. In the end, there is a threat that the explosive device is armed with chemical or biological agents. To protect from this specific kind of danger, some bomb suits are also equipped with self-containing breathing apparatus. A modern EOD suit is designed to protect from all these dangers. During World War II, bomb technicians had no special suits or any kind of protective gear whatsoever. There were simply no available materials that could provide protection from blasts such as from aerial bombs or unexploded artillery shells, or even from landmines. Two decades later, the first types of suits appeared. They consisted of flak vests that were worn over chainmail shirts and were then combined with armor-plated head coverings. EOD technicians wearing these suits largely resembled medieval Templars. Only after materials such as Kevlar found their way into military use did the modern type of bomb suits appear. Using these materials, the first EOD suits that we know today were made in the 1990s. They provided better protection and covered the entire body. Its Kevlar was strong enough to stop the impact of bomb fragments but was unable to withhold the blast wave. This problem was later solved by adding foam layers that absorbed the blast. Further improvements were also made to protect the technician from chemical and biological agents. Modern EOD suits consist of several sections, the trousers, a jacket with a high collar, and a groin section. The entire suit is coated with a flame retardant fabric that protects the technician from heat blasts and fire. The inside sections are fitted with protective inserts consisting of thick layers of ballistic material, foam, and fiber which provide fragmentation and overpressure protection. For additional protection, the chest, lower abdomen, and the spine are protected with armored steel plates with an absorbing layer of foam for the spine plate. Each section provides various fragmentation protection levels with the ability to stop fragments from penetrating the suit with a velocity of 1,100 feet per second at the trousers and up to 3,200 feet per second on the collar. 
The chest and spine plates, meanwhile, have a special level of protection, capable of stopping fragments at 5,200 feet per second. The head is the most important part of the body is protected with a ballistic helmet with a visor made of scratch-resistant acrylic with polycarbonate backing. The inside of the helmet is equipped with an air ventilation and radio communication system. Additional protection for the head is provided by the high collar. Not only does it give fragmentation protection, it also secures the head from an abrupt change in position when hit by a blast. And finally, the feet are protected by protective overshoes. The only part of the body that isn't protected are the hands, which need to be dexterous. Bomb technicians don't wear gloves as they reduce the sensation in their fingers. When handling biochemical explosive devices, technicians also wear chemical protective undergarments. Even though EOD suits have evolved over time to provide the best possible protection and comfort for technicians in the field, they still do come with a set of drawbacks. The most obvious is the bulkiness of the entire suit, which can weigh up to 80 pounds. This is quite a heavy burden for a technician that needs to focus on neutralizing the explosive device. It also reduces his mobility to a large degree. There have been cases in Afghanistan and Iraq where technicians were caught in the crossfire and killed because they were unable to run away from the scene to look for cover. Another important drawback is that the structure of the suit and materials used do not allow heat dissipation. This results in high temperatures inside the suit, going up to 122 degrees Fahrenheit, which then can lead to serious heat stress and heat illness. The latest EOD suit designs have made some progress in dealing with these issues. The EOD-10 suit, which is used by the United States Air Force in EOD operations, comes with a bodysuit that has an integrated cooling system that consists of a water pump that circulates cold water through small tubes wrapped around the entire suit. The suit also has improved mobility as it has a more compact design and utilizes the latest lightweight ballistic materials that significantly reduce the overall weight. Despite being cumbersome and difficult to withstand, EOD suits were still the first choice of protection for EOD technicians in the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq since 2001. There were, however, opposing experiences with EOD suits, primarily because of the overheating issues. While on the mission, EOD specialists preferred not to use suits until they began working on neutralizing the IED. Some, not even then. They believed suit protection was insufficient against IEDs and preferred working wearing only light protection that didn't cause heat stroke. Not using the suit may be why US forces lost more than 50 EOD technicians on missions in Iraq and Afghanistan. On the other hand, EOD suits saved the lives of many technicians. Once hit by an explosion, these suits significantly increase their chances of surviving. Sniper Shields, World War I. Sniper shields were one of the technical innovations that appeared on the battlefield of the First World War. There are many variants of sniper shields, ranging from lightweight to heavy versions, and were inspired by the mantlets from centuries before. The first sniper shields, or set shields, were introduced by the British, who used them on an enormous scale. Reports say that in 1917, over 200,000 were deployed on the Western Front. They had a typical design with a loophole for the rifle, which could be protected by a shutter. These shields were capable of protecting against German rounds at a distance of 50 yards, but could be penetrated by reversed bullets. The Germans also designed and used sniper shields. At first, they used large magnesium steel plates that were being placed on trench parapets. Later, they introduced the Model 1916 Infanterie Shield, a 24-inch wide, 18-inch tall sniper shield weighing 30 pounds. The silicon nickel steel plate was 0.23 inches thick and was able to protect from British 303 rounds at a distance of 100 yards. The plate had a loophole designed for a right-hand sniper and a movable shutter. Some models even had a double loophole for binoculars at the center of the plate. The shield plate was slightly bent along its edges to protect against shrapnel and ricochets. Even though it was designed for mobile use, the Model 1916 sniper shield was too heavy to carry around, especially while crawling. Furthermore, it's designed only to protect the shooter from the front side. The Germans therefore inserted the shields into trench parapets, covering them with sandbags and hiding them with camouflage. Protected with these shields, placed at intervals of 100 yards in disposition to protect each other's flanks, German snipers became a difficult obstacle for British soldiers. 
Since the Model 1916 sniper shields were not able to protect the shooter from armor-piercing shells and heavy-caliber hunting rifles that the British introduced onto the battlefield, the Germans designed a stronger model, referred to as the Model 1916-1917, with a steel plate thickness of 0.42 inches. The shield was wider at 26 inches wide and was 12 inches tall and had a mouse-hole aperture at the bottom of the plate. This model also had side plates that were used as the stand and the protection for the sniper from ricochets and lead splash. However, this sniper shield weighed 50 pounds and was very difficult to handle. Besides the German and British designs, sniper shields were being used by other armies as well. The common thing for all of them was that they were too heavy and cumbersome for mobile use for which they were initially designed. The McAdam Shield Shovel We attack World War I, the McAdam Shield Shovel, or Hughes Shovel, was a two-in-one solution designed for the trenches of World War I by a Canadian named Sam Hughes, who was the Minister for the Department of Militia and Defense in 1913. The device would resemble a standard infantry shovel with a hole in it, so that it could also act as a sniper's shield. The shovel would be named after Ina McAdam, Hughes's personal secretary who suggested the idea in 1913 when she saw Swiss troops digging trenches and suggested that they could combine their entrenching tools with bulletproof shields. To use it as a shield, the soldier would lie in prone with the rifle placed through the hole, with the shovel handle rotated 90 degrees to expose the spike that drove into the ground. In 1914, 25,000 shield shovels were produced for the Canadian Army. Hughes proclaimed them a Canadian miracle device, but after field testing, it was clear that the expensive piece of equipment had many problems. It was heavy because of the thick steel necessary to deflect a bullet, and difficult to carry as it had no carrying handle. Even worse, the shield shovel couldn't actually deflect bullets, even if they were small in caliber and was not good for digging because of the hole in the blade. High-ranking Canadian and British military officials, including Arthur Curry, refused to accept the shield shovel. It was stated by Saturday Night Magazine that the McAdam Shield Shovel was only good for one thing, opening tins. The shovels were soon replaced by British entrenching tools and turned into scrap metal, although some Canadian snipers did make use of the device, placing many together for effective protection. Mobile Shields World War I Weird Tech World War I was the war of innovations and new types of weapons and equipment. A lot of effort was made to protect the soldiers both in the trenches and in no man's land. One way to do it was with the help of infantry shields. Sniper shields were a kind of small metal shield that served to protect snipers from enemy fire. These were good as protection if he was well concealed, but were far too heavy to be used when advancing. For that reason, mobile shields were introduced to be carried by soldiers into battle. These shields were initially quite small and therefore only provided minimal protection to the soldiers. They only really protected the soldier's torso, leaving his limbs exposed to a risk of injury. There was a tendency to make big, strong, and heavy shields that could protect a soldier's entire body. It also had to be able to be moved around the battlefield. The only solution was to put wheels on them. These were to be known as mobile shields. Their purpose was to provide cover to one or several soldiers that were advancing across the field or no man's land. The idea of shields on wheels was actually born a few decades earlier, during the Cuban War, when US troops used the first movable shields. The idea was adopted by the British and French armies and brought into service during World War I. Even though all designs included heavy steel plates that were capable of withstanding small arms fire, their use was questionable in reality. The first mobile shield was created by the French. It was quite a simple design that consisted of a heavy steel gun shield mounted on two large hollow wooden wheels. The wheels were filled with sand to give them some weight and make them stable while moving. The front plate had a slot with a movable shutter. Looking through the slot, a soldier was able to see the direction in which he was crawling, but was also able to aim and fire his rifle. The French introduced the shield in 1917, and by the end of the war had made a considerable number of them. They were mostly used for cutting through barbed wire. Hidden behind the shield, the soldier was protected from enemy fire while crawling towards his objective. 
The British one-man tank was a bit more complex. This mobile shield was made completely out of metal, including the wheels. The hull was made of chrome nickel steel and covered almost the entire body of the soldier, up to his thighs. The inside of the hull was fitted with grips for the soldier to hold so he could handle the shield. In order to move it, the soldier had to crawl on his knees, which was a very uncomfortable position. On the bottom side, it had two hinged skirts that provided side protection while moving about on uneven terrain. Unlike the French design, the one-man tank had two horizontal and two vertical slits on both sides of the plate that served as viewports. On the left side, there was an additional slot for aiming and firing a rifle. This had a shutter to close when it was not required. The front plate had an angular shape in order to deflect small arms fire. The French version had a large hook mounted on the front plate so that it could be towed into position if necessary. The British designed another two mobile shields during the war. Both were of a much larger and heavier construction than the one-man tank. The first one was a larger scale version of the French design and was big enough to provide cover for five soldiers. It had five embrasures on the front plate, three on the top part and two on the bottom part of the plate. It was very cumbersome and difficult to move, and it never went beyond the trial stage of its development. The second large mobile shield was really huge. It was called the Pedrail. It was a platform for a machine gun with a large, thick front plate and two hinged side plates. Both side plates had four slots for the rifleman. The front shield was 5 feet 11 inches wide, or 1.8 meters, and 4 feet 11 inches, or 1 and a half meters tall. With the side plates fully open, the shield had a width of 9 feet 10 inches, or 3 meters. With a machine gun mounted, it weighed 3,000 pounds, or 1,360 kilograms, making it very difficult to move around. It seemed that both these shields were designed for static rolls only, probably as road or street barricades. Mobile shields featured on the Eastern Front as well. A German photo from 1914 shows the Russians had mobile shields of their own. It is unknown whether they produced them on a larger scale or not, but it's obvious that they were aware of the concept. The Russian mobile shield was also huge. It was wide enough to protect five soldiers standing and another five in a prone position. Therefore, it had 10 slots set in two rows on the sloped front plate. On the side, the shield had two large diameter wheels and four small auxiliary wheels behind the plate. The construction was so bulky that it needed a lot of manpower to be moved around. Basically, the mobile shield was just too bulky and unwieldy to be of any use. They were very big, very heavy, and therefore very slow out in the field and unable to keep up with the advancing infantry. The sluggishness, however, seemed to be a minor problem regarding their mobility. The whole construction of mobile shields was too crude to be able to move around on the moonlight craters of the terrain of the World War I battlefields. Heavy metal wheels had no suspension, which made a terrain filled with shell holes impassable even to the smallest mobile shields. Finally, all mobile shields were designed to protect a soldier from small arms fire being directed in front of him, except for the British one-man tank, which also protected the sides. Since they had no other protection, soldiers behind the shield were completely vulnerable to shrapnel coming from shells exploding around and above them. Because of the poor protection that they offered and their lack of maneuverability, mobile shields became perfect targets for the artillery, which was the most destructive weapon on the battlefield. These disadvantages questioned justifying the use of the shield and were probably the reasons why they were not used on a larger scale. In any case, mobile shields stand as another curious weapon of World War I. Roman Legionary, 1st century BC to the 3rd century AD. Tunics worn by legionaries were not too different from those of ordinary citizens. It was the belt, balteus, and the sandal boots, caligae, that made the legionaries' appearance distinctive. They were a symbol that you belong to the military. If a soldier was discharged dishonorably, his belt was confiscated as he was not deemed worthy anymore of wearing it. Belts were made either as a single waist type or as a two-crossed belt with silver or bronze embossed plate decorations and an attached apron made in the same fashion. They were used for carrying a dagger and a sword. Sandaled boots, as another distinctive feature of legionary clothing, allowed legionaries to weather long marches on various types of terrain. 
These heavy-duty sandals outsoles were made of one piece of cowhide or oxhide. They were attached to thick leather soles with hobnails. The sound of these hobnails announced the arrival of the legionaries. Armor was an important part of the legionaries' equipment. It protected his upper body in battle. It came in three different versions. The most recognizable was a cuirass made of segments, lorica segmentata. The cuirass consisted of metal plates and hoops fastened to internal leather strips. The design allowed adequate mobility in combat, but its protection was limited to torso and shoulders only. The weight of the cuirass was about 20 pounds or 9 kilograms. There's a lot of controversy about how common cuirasses were among legionaries. It's more plausible that they used iron ringmail shirts, lorica humtata, on a far larger scale. Male shirts were made both sleeveless and with short sleeves and were long enough to cover the thighs. The shoulder region was reinforced with additional pieces of leather faced with rings. The standard male shirt consisted of around 30,000 rings and weighed up to 33 pounds or 15 kilograms. The third type of armor was a scale armor, Lorica squamata. It consisted of a number of small iron scale-like plates attached to a thick doublet made of linen and stuffed with wool. It was worn in combination with peterouge, overlapping leather strips attached to the edges of the armor to protect the upper parts of the arms and legs. This type of armor was the cheapest and provided the least protection. The shield, the scutum, provided the legionary extra protection. The scutum was made of three layers of wood in a crosswise arrangement and was faced with felt and calfskin on the outer surface. The shield was slightly thinner on the edges than at the center where it had a prominent wooden boss. At the beginning, the scutum had an oval shape and was curved, but in the Augustan age, it took the shape of a curved rectangle. The size of the shield varied. Usually, it was around 2.5 feet or 76 centimeters in width and 4 feet or 120 centimeters in length. The variety of sizes and materials used to construct it affected the weight of the shield, which varied from 12 pounds to 22 pounds or 5.5 to 10 kilograms. Because of the weight, shields were held by the horizontal grip with a straight arm. Shields were used not only to protect from enemy blows, but also for hitting and toppling the enemy. Hoplite, Ancient Greece, 7th through the 4th centuries BCE. As the core of the Greek military from the 7th through the 4th centuries BCE, hoplites derive their name from the phrase to hopla, meaning equipment or tool. Greek hoplites were heavy infantry soldiers, citizen soldiers who equipped themselves when called to fight for the polis, or city-state. According to Homer's Iliad, hoplites were identified by their spear, shield, and helmet while walking in their tight-lined formations. As citizen soldiers rather than professional fighters, hoplites were required to provide their own weapons. As a result, the quality of armor, weapons, and shields varied by wealth and social status. Armor consisted of a cuirass, a helmet, shield, and greaves. The cuirass included a breastplate and a backplate fastened together. Armor was made out of bronze, leather, linen, or some combination of these materials. Greaves protected the shins. They fell out of use during the 5th century BCE. Round, concave shields called hoplons were crafted out of wood, leather, and bronze as well with a band on the inside for the hoplites to put their left arm through. An additional strap on the rim helped a hoplite hold on to the shield as he went into battle. Shields were about three feet or one meter in diameter. They protected soldiers from chin to shin. Sometimes these shields carried special designs on them. Famous examples include the Gorgon from Greek mythology or the inverted V of the Spartan hoplites. The weaponry of the bloodthirsty Viking raiders, 8th to 11th century. Though we often think of the Vikings of Scandinavia as being barbarians, when it came to warfare, they were quite advanced warriors as well as being highly practical. So they tended to favor weapons that served a purpose in everyday life as well as on the battlefield. As for their own armored protection, the natural thick furs they wore most of the time to keep out the bittery snowy climate they inhabited naturally gave them a high degree of protection. Sometimes metal riveted helmets were also worn. As for the ones with wings or horns on them, despite popular belief, they were never used by the Vikings in battle and were worn for purely ceremonial purposes. The Vikings regularly used shields that were typically of a medium size and circular design. They were light, 
yet amazingly strong and reinforced with iron rims and leather padding on the back of them. They were simply painted in one or two vivid colors, often with a basic symbolic design or a rune on it. In battle, the Vikings were fond of head-on wild charges in order to quickly overwhelm the enemy. Nevertheless, they could also be quite disciplined when fighting, being well trained in the use of their famous shield wall or Schaldborg formation. This was when a large group of Viking warriors would form an almost impenetrable line of interlocked shields and from behind them use spears to thrust at their attacking adversaries. But maybe the best weapon the Vikings had was their unwavering fighting spirit and their deep-rooted belief that to die in battle was the greatest honor that could be bestowed upon a warrior. Ned Kelly, the Armored Criminal, Bush Ranger, 1855 to 1880. Edward Ned Kelly is Australia's most famous Bush Ranger. Ned was born in June 1855 at Beveridge, Victoria, Australia. He was the eldest son of eight children to John Red Kelly, an Irish convict exiled to Australia, and Ellen Quinn. In 1869, Kelly found his first brush with the law when he was arrested for assaulting a Chinese farmer and was held in police custody for several days. In 1871, he was arrested for riding a stolen horse and fighting the police. As a result, he was sentenced to three years in prison at age 16. Kelly was released six months early from Pentridge Prison on the 2nd of February, 1874 for good behavior. In April, 1878, Ned and his brother Dan Kelly went into hiding from the police after Ned was accused of shooting Constable Fitzpatrick when Dan was being arrested for horse theft. There are different accounts from both sides as to whether Kelly shot the constable or whether the wound was self-inflicted. Ned Kelly's mother and the others were arrested for abetting the attempted murder of Fitzpatrick. Ned and Dan Kelly, now on the run, were joined by fellow Bush Rangers Joe Byrne and Steve Hart, forming the Kelly Gang. In October, the gang killed three policemen who were tracking them during a shootout at Stringy Bark Creek. One of the police troopers, Constable McIntyre, escaped on horse and reported the killings. The Victorian Parliament outlawed the gang, and the reward for each gang member was raised to 500 pounds, dead or alive. The gang committed a series of armed bank robberies at the end of 1878 and early 1879 in rural towns. During this time, there were sympathizers for the outlaws, who kept an eye out for the police. Some supported the gang because Kelly was seen as a man of the people, a poor, working-class man against the wealthy landowners. Others, because of fear of reprisals to giving away the whereabouts of the gang to the police. As a form of protection for potential future bank robberies, Ned Kelly and his gang constructed armor made from plow mold boards. The padded iron armor featured a headpiece, breast, and back plates and an apron which altogether weighed about 97 pounds, or 44 kilograms. In June 1880, the gang, after killing a police informant named Aaron Sherritt, tried to derail a police train in Glenrowan by forcing two railway workers to damage the tracks. Dressed in the armor they had made, they had took hostages in the hotel there. When the police train arrived, it was stopped before it could be derailed, as schoolteacher Thomas Kernow had warned the driver Earlier, Kurnow had convinced the sleep-deprived Ned to release him. Ned did so and told him to go quietly to bed and not to dream too loud. Otherwise, they would shoot him. The police surrounded the hotel and a shootout commenced. During their last stand, the gang's lack of sleep and alcohol intoxication caused an overconfidence in the armor. The three gang members were killed, except for Ned. Ned had fired at the police with his revolver, and the police's bullet fire bounced off his armor. However, he was incapacitated when the police aimed at his legs, which had no protection. Ned Kelly was put on trial and sentenced to death by hanging. His last words were reported as, Ah, well, I suppose it has come to this. And by other accounts as, Such is life. Kelly was buried in an unmarked grave, and it is presumed that his remains were dug up by souvenir hunters. In the 1970s, Ned Kelly's skull was stolen from a museum display and has not been found to this day.